Welcome to Living Answers for Today. I'm Pastor George Westlake from Sheffield Family Life Center in Kansas City, Missouri, here to answer your questions about the Word of God to help with problems that you might be facing in the Christian life. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, to let you know that he himself is the way to God. Religion is dead. Jesus Christ is alive and well. As an ex-Muslim said in our pulpit just a few years ago, he said, as a Muslim, I examined all the religions of the world and found out that everything is a religion except Christianity, and it is a relationship. The Bible says, he that has the Son has life, and he that doesn't have the Son does not have life. The Bible referring to Jesus said, as many as receive him, to them he gives power to become the children of God to those that are believing in his name. So Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. And to prove it, he paid the bill for our sin on the cross of Calvary, and God raised him from the dead three days later. The proof that everything he said is absolutely true. Again, this is a Bible question and answer program. You can you can send in your live questions. You can send them in, uh, in, the, in the comments section on Facebook, because we're on both Facebook and YouTube. A lot of folks have already sent them in by email, drgwwjrgmail.com. But while the program's on, it works better if you send them in live. And again, on the comment section of Facebook, I'm going to go ahead and start taking the questions because we've had so many about the coronavirus. Question after question after question. Is this a fulfillment of Bible prophecy? I did a Friday night uh, 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 service last week for a seniors group for the whole Kansas City area. And it was a question and answer session. I, I just love doing those. Sometimes I go to churches and do them and, and all kinds of situations like that. And one of the questions asked was, was this one of the plagues from the book of Revelation? No, we are not into the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation from chapter four on is all future. It's future. It's what's going to happen. How God is going to end this age. That's why. That's why I call my book Chapter Sixty Six. The Bible has sixty six books in it, and the Book of Revelation is the end and conclusion of the story. And people are pulling scriptures out of context. I understand, and the social media, and trying to put us into the Book of Revelation. We are not there. Okay, this is not one of the plagues of Revelation. It is a plague. Um, in Luke 21 and also in Matthew 24, talking about the signs of the coming of the Lord and the signs of the things that are going to happen. One of the things mentioned in both chapters is pestilence. That's old English for disease. There have always been diseases and they're going to increase. There's still to be wars and rumors of war. Nation must rise against nation, but the end is not yet. Famine, earthquakes, and pestilence in various places, but the end is not yet. Says these are the beginning of birth pains. Now, when birth pains begin, we know the baby's going to be born. But you can't tell how long when it comes to Bible prophecy because God's time is not our time. Uh, you know, God promised Abraham you're going to have a son, not only going to have your son, but down, down, down in the generations, there's going to be one of your generation in whom all nations of the earth are going to be blessed, referring to Jesus. Well, that took place 2,000 years later, that promise of God. So we can't put God on our timetable. And when Jesus was talking about future events, he said, it's not for you to know when these things are going to happen. It's not for you to know how much time is going to pass, nor the appointed time. And if Jesus said, it's not for you to know, that means it's not for you to know. You're not going to figure it out by signs in the heavens. You're not going to figure it out by pestilence or disease. You're not going to be figured out by earthquakes. You're not going to be able to figure it out by the Jewish calendar. All the way through the Bible, New Testament, we are told he is coming as a thief. In such an hour as you think not, he is coming. There's two things in the New Testament happen as a thief in the night. One is the event we call the rapture of the church. The Greek word uses the uh, the Greeks use the word parousia, coming, which is used by itself without modifiers to refer to that event. And the other one is the beginning of the day of the Lord. So the rapture of the church takes place, and the, and the day of the Lord, the great tribulation begins. These are the only two events that we're told come as a thief in the night. The battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19, when Jesus comes back as king of kings and lord of lords, they're, they're going to know the very day he's coming back. 
That's why the armies will be gathered in the valley of Megiddo to make war against him. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 20. He is coming back. Revelation chapter 19, 20. You can read all those things that are going to happen. And he is coming back. But they're going to know the very time that he is coming back. But the rapture of the church and the beginning of the tribulation take place as a thief in the night without any warning whatsoever. He might come today. He might not come for a few more years. But prophecy is taking place at warp speed. The things people said many, many years ago were going to happen are happening now all over the social media on the on the news you're watching on television, taking place, getting ready for the coming of the Lord. Jesus Christ is coming, and he's coming for those that are his. He is going to be coming. But the coronavirus is like any other virus. It may be stronger than some of the others we've had. It may not be. There's a lot of prophecies going on about it. There's a lot of medical concern because of the number of people that have died in China. I remind you that in the rest of the world, both people, both more people have actually died from flu every year than are dying from this, but we have to we have to take it very cautiously. We have to listen to the experts and try to use the advice and to wash our hands and those kind of things that they tell us to do. But you don't have to live in fear of something that's taking place. God doesn't want his people living in fear. We trust God. As the psalmist said, though I walk through the valley of the deepest darkness or you know, as the King James translates it, the valley of the shadow of death. I won't fear the evil one because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So we don't have to be afraid of those things. When we walk, Jesus said, though you fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name and your mind. When you walk through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you pass through the fire, you will not be burned. And neither will the flame kindle upon you. Prophet. And that's a promise from the book of Isaiah. And God promises to be with you. He doesn't want his people living in fear. We can trust God no matter what takes place in this world. Our God is able to take care of us. If he can fireproof Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he can take care of you and he can take care of me. So don't get overly concerned about it. Be cautious as the medical experts are telling us to do. But don't be overly concerned. Christians should not live in fear. We should live in confidence, trusting our God that he will take us through no matter what the situation be. I know some of the countries overseas where I go overseas and teach. Some of my friends have said for years, aren't you afraid to go over there? They might kill you. I said, hey, if it's my time to go home, I'm going home if I'm here. And, and if it isn't my time, all the people over there aren't going to kill me. It's not going to be my time to go into the presence of God. So God takes care of us. He's promised to take care of us. He says the very hairs of our head are numbered. So don't live in fear. You can trust the God that created you and the God that gives you life. We have another question here. Uh, does it matter if we pray to God the Father, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit? Well, you know, God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you read in John 14, Jesus said, whatsoever you ask in my name, I will do it. That the Father ask me in my name, I will do it. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. And when Jesus healed, when he was walking by the shores of Galilee, he said, my Father works this way and I am working, meaning I'm under the direction of my Father, but when I heal, it's by my power. He didn't stop being God the Son when he became a man. 100% God, 100% man. That's why Isaiah prophesied the virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. You shall call his name Emmanuel, well, and actually literally in Hebrew, with us God, meaning God is with us. He was 100% God and 100% man. He did not lay aside his deity. He did not lay aside his power. What did he lay aside? He laid aside the prerogatives of deity. In other words, he only used his power as his father told him to do it. That's why in the temptation, when Satan said, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread, he certainly could have done it. He had the power, but he would have been using his power outside of his father's will. He came to be obedient to his father's will to pay the price for our sin, but he still had the power to do all of those things. 100% man, 100% God. In Philippians, Paul says this, though he continuously existed in the form of God, that means prior to his birth as God the Son, the angels of God and even the demons, if they were fallen by that, looked at him and knew by his very form that he was God. 
even though he continues existed in the form of God, he did not count that form a prize to be eagerly hung on to. But he emptied himself, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man, meaning he not only looked like a man, he became a man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name above every name, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things on the earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Like the Bible says, there's one name under heaven given among men whereby men might be saved. It's the name of Jesus Christ. So it's not wrong to ask him. And we sing songs in our service, Holy Spirit, come and fill this place. Okay, we sing that. We sing a lot of them songs. We ask the Holy Spirit to draw near because the Holy God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, if you think you're going to fully understand the Trinity, you're probably going to blow every fuse you have in your head, which is what I do. I mentioned before when we did the live television program for 24 years, Bible Questions and Answers, and my wife was sitting there when we first started the program, and someone asked me to explain the Trinity. I said, I can't explain her, let alone the Trinity. What makes you think I can explain a God who has always been, who always will be. He knows the end from the beginning. He sees everything ahead of time. He has always existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At a point in time, God the Son became a human being, lived without sin for 33 years, and God the Father put all of your sin and all of my sin, the sin of every human being that ever has lived or ever will live, on him and punished him in our place on the cross of Calvary. So that when we come to him today because our sin has been punished, God is able to forgive our sin and declare us not guilty of ever having sin. He's able to forgive us and forget us. He's able to send his spirit to live on the inside and change our lives. I can't explain that, but I know it's real because it happened to me. I know he's alive. I know he's real because I met him and he transformed my life when I was 19 years old. And I've seen him do it for thousands of people around the world ever since. He changes lives. He transforms people and makes himself real makes himself real. So uh, it, it isn't wrong to pr pr pray to the Son. It isn't wrong to pray to the Holy Spirit. You can get real technical about prayer. Just cry out to God. Just cry out to God. Can you explain New Testament prophecy? Well, in the New Testament, uh, there is a gift of prophecy. I remind you that prophets in the Old Testament, they, uh, the Bible says they spake not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And what Peter means by that, that uh, you go back and read the prophets, they were primary preachers to their own generation, but they preached the things that God told them to preach, and then God would insert prophecies of the future. But really prophesying is speaking for God. A New Testament prophecy, the gift of prophecy, is mentioned in the book of Acts. Mentions certain people that were prophets. Uh, it says Philip had four daughters that prophesied. And by the way, they probably didn't do it in the kitchen. They, okay, he had four daughters that prophesied. Uh, the, you have the prophetess Anna that prophesied over Jesus at his birth. The prophet Simeon that prophesied over Jesus at his birth. Um, the Bible talks in the book of Ephesians about him. Uh, uh, about apostles, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, there is a prophetical ministry. But the Bible does say this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says to test the prophets, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It indicates that there are gifts of prophecy that take place in the congregation and that you should test them. In the Old Testament, if they weren't true, they stoned them. But you should test the prophecy and see whether it's from God. Uh, and the Bible teaches that prophecy is for exhortation, edification, and encouragement. Uh, uh, that's what 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 teach that prophecy is all about in New Testament times. Okay, encouragement, exhortation, and, and those kinds of things to build you up. It's not a yam, yam, yam condemnation type of thing. When you read what the what the Bible says in first and second, uh, in first Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And so you have to test the prophets because there's always the human element enter into it. 
If I'd have paid attention to all the prophecies that were given me over the last 47 years, I'd have been doing everything but what I've done the last 47 years. I've been at the same church, uh, Sheffield Family Life Center in Kansas City, Missouri. I've, I actually came here in March of 1973 and served 33 years as senior pastor. And the last 14 years as pastor emeritus, still teaching every Wednesday night, still preaching when my son asked me to. He's a senior pastor now. And I still preach other places. And I'm and I'm ministering. But uh, the, 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 the prophecies that people would come up to me and say, I'd have been doing everything but what I was doing. Now, some people would come up and they gave me a word from the Lord. You're doing what God called you to do. But if, if I'd listened to them, some of them would have had me a missionary. Some of them would be, would have had me an evangelist. Some of them would have had me as a, as a Bible college instructor. Some of them would have had me as a Bible college president. And I remember a number of years ago when Central Bible College, the president resigned, a lot of people, several people told me, you should be president. I said, no, God has not called me to be in a Bible college. He's called me to be a pastor. And I knew what God had called me to do. God may send someone with a prophetical word to encourage you, but God has not given anyone a prophetical word to direct your life. He will only give it to encourage you something that he has already shown you. And he does use prophecy for that purpose. I know when I was called into the ministry, I've told you this before, I told God I can't talk. I stammer when I, I'm so bad like I do on this program. I don't do it when I preach. Because that night when I was called, called, God told me I wouldn't do that when I was standing behind the pulpit preaching. But some days I can't carry on a conversation. But I still had doubts after I knew God had called me when I was 19. I was saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and called to preach. And I argued with God, said, I can't talk. And God gave me a passage in Jeremiah where he said, that I made the tongue. And God promised me that day. Now, I preached for over 60 years and never one time in the pulpit. But I had several people come along in different parts of the country when I was there. God has called you, and he will keep his promise to you. And he has kept his promise all the way down through these years. So I don't have to fear when I get up to preach the gospel that I'm going to do that because God has given a promise. But, but he, he may send prophets along to encourage you. But, but there's a lot of false prophecy going on today. I know some of our members went to, went to hear a so-called prophet, what they were saying. God told me you're supposed to give me a thousand dollars. That is kind of stuff is not from God. That's false prophecy. That's why the Bible says to check the prophets out and to test them and see if they're truly from God. A true prophet is not going to prophesy that you're supposed to give him so much money. Simply not going to do that in New Testament times. There was an occasion, recall when Elisha came and the woman, I mean, all she had was a little bit of oil and stuff. And she, and he said, make a cake for me first. And God provided all of her needs. That's an Old Testament prophet. That's not a New Testament prophet. New Testament prophets weren't those kind of people. So New Testament prophecy, God can give someone a word for you. And I've heard people speak in a congregation and give a prophecy that would have to do with someone. And the, now, message in tongues plus interpretation is equal to prophecy. Because in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, in the case when you have the manifestations of the Spirit, such as a message in tongues, followed by interpretation or a prophecy, it gives nine different manifestations of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, it should be taking place in church services. And it... And it very clearly indicates the primary purpose is to edify the whole body. So if God gives someone a prophecy or a, or a tongue and interpretation, it's to edify the whole body, not just a certain individual. Can you summarize the book of Kings? Well, actually, first and second Kings were one book in the original Hebrew Bible. And it starts out as the ministry of Elijah and the ministry of Elisha. It has the division of the two kingdoms. Uh, right after Solomon's death, First Kings talked about David and the early part of Solomon's life. And then you have the story of how Solomon died and, and his son took over. And then Jerob, uh, Jeroboam I went north and started the northern kingdom of Israel. Ten of the tribes went north and two of the tribes stayed south, Benjamin and Judah. And there were also people from every tribe that stayed there. By the way, while I'm mentioning that, there are no lost tribes of Israel. God doesn't lose things. You see, in, 580, uh, in 722 B.C., the, 
how the Assyrians came in and they took the people of the northern kingdom of Israel away to captivity to Assyria. In the meantime, Babylon conquered Assyria. And then 586 BC, the Babylonians came and took the southern kingdom, but they took them to the same place where the other 10 tribes had already been taken. And there's a thing called British Israelism where someone came up with the idea, well, there are 10 lost tribes of Israel and they migrated to Europe and then they migrated to the United States and they tried to make the United States the lost tribes of Israel. There are no lost tribes of Israel. There are people from every tribe there in Israel today. There are probably people from every tribe here in Kansas City, probably every tribe in, in New York City and the big cities of the world. And I read a book where someone once said, well, they're not sure who they are. Well, God's sure who they are. God doesn't lose track of things. I reminded when I did the TV program and someone called me and said, well, what about the lost books of the Bible? I said, God doesn't lose things. He has in his word exactly the books that he wants in his word. If I didn't believe that God could give me a book to say exactly what he wanted me to hear, he wouldn't be much of a God but he is able to inspire people to write what he wanted. Now it has human characteristics on. The writings of Paul are different than the writing of James. The writing of James is a lot different than the author of the book of Hebrews, but it's all inspired by God. And God moved on human beings to write what he wanted written so we can have confidence in the word of God, in, in the word of God. Why was it a snake that deceived Eve? I don't know why. It just seemed like Satan picked that out. I guess it was a gorgeous creature if it was up. And don't forget all the animals were friendly. Uh, there wasn't any danger from the animals. You know, Adam could walk up to a lion and say, sit and the lion would sit because God gave him authority over all creation. Now, Adam and Eve lost that authority when they sinned. Okay, they lost that authority. And in the book of Hebrews chapter two, it says God put all things under his feet, but we don't see all things under him. Why? Because sin came into the world. It was on to say, but we see Jesus who was made for a short time lower than the angels. What does that mean? So he could die for the suffering of death, that he by the grace of God should, uh, by, he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. So God picked out the serpent uh, and I don't know why, and I don't know why Satan picked out the serpent, except God has foreknowledge. And he might have decided it was a good symbol to use for Satan down through time, since God knows everything ahead of time. And he might have influenced, uh, he might have somehow influenced, uh, uh, you know, he might have influenced Satan to take the serpent. We don't know. We're not told it at all, except even in the book of Revelation, uh, you know, Satan is called the old serpent. Uh, it's called the dragon, the old serpent, the devil, and Satan. Now, the devil, the Greek word diabolos, the diabolical one, and, and the word the Satan uh, is actually Hebrew, hasatan, means the accuser. Oh, okay, okay, the accuser. And uh, it, uh, so, so he is the accuser. And in the Bible, it chooses to use him as a picture of, of a has a picture of a serpent, very subtle and sneaky, so God might have influenced that so he could use it later on as a as an ideal. What is your opinion of fanaticism? Well, some people have have more zeal than knowledge. You know, they rush in where angels had fear to tread. And I know when I first got saved, I did I had about as much wisdom as I didn't have enough common sense to, to just not scream the gospel at everybody. Because I was so excited about what I found, I thought everyone would accept it, everyone would believe it, and I just didn't go about it the right way. So, so to me, people sometimes have no wisdom, and the Bible says, if, if you act wisdom, you can ask of God in the book of James, and he'll give you wisdom. So we not only only need to have a good testimony of what God's able to do, we need to have a good testimony of how to use it, and you can. Uh, you can just uh, you can try to pound people over the head with the gospel, and that doesn't work. God wants us to use wisdom, and be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Is what Jesus Christ Himself said: "As wise as serpents and harmless as doves." Can you explain the fivefold ministry gifts, and should these gifts be active in a single church assembly? Let me talk about quote the fivefold gifts. 
uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, in Ephesians chapter 4, let me turn over here to the book of Ephesians. And, it's, and I have several comments about this. Ephesians chapter 4, that, uh, that question just came in. Ephesians chapter 4. Some of the pages don't like the term. Now, Paul mentions in Ephesians 3 that his ministry is a result of the gift of God. It's a result of the gift and the grace of God. Let me read that. Okay. I'm going to start reading. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you've heard the administration of the grace of God, which is given to me for your benefit, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. Now, a mystery in the Bible is something that's been hidden but is now revealed, okay? Something that's been hidden but is now revealed. That's explained in Romans 16 for you. That you mean, how that by revelation he'd made known to me the mystery as I wrote previously in few words, whereby when you read it, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men and is now revealed, unto his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and sharers of his promise in the Christ, if you know, by the gospel. Now, that's the mystery in Ephesians. The mystery of God in Ephesians is the fact that the Gentiles are heirs of Christ. If you read Colossians, the mystery is called Christ in you, the hope of glory, something that has been hidden but is now revealed. And then he says, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God. If you have a ministry, it's a gift of God's grace. You can't walk around and say, well, God did that for me because I'm Mr. Spiritual or Mrs. Spiritual. No, no. Any ministry is a gift of God's grace. And a grace is something you get that you don't deserve. I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God by the effective energizing of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Then he says later on in verse 4, when he ascended on, he says in verse 7 in chapter 4, under every one of us is given grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, actually, there's a, there's a verse here that is misused, Okay. And what Paul is going to describe now in Ephesians 4 is the Roman triumphant procession. And when a great general would march back into Rome and he'd won a great victory, the more notable principles, uh, uh, the captains, the generals, the kings, the queens, he had on display as his prisoner, he was considered a greater conqueror. And this is the picture that Paul uses here in Ephesians 4. He uses a technical term for the Roman triumphant procession. And he says, unto every one of us are given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Okay. In the same way Paul had the gift. Okay. Same way here. Grace. He said, when he ascended on high, he led a train of vanquished foes and gives gifts unto men. So what he pictures is Jesus Christ conquering people. And we know it's by his love as you read the Bible. Then he turns around and gives those he has conquered back to the church as apostles, prophets, evangelists pastors and teachers. And this verse is sometimes used. It says, uh, he led captivity a captive and gave gifts unto men, but actually he led a multitude of captives captive. And he gives what? He gives them back as gifts to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints that the saints might do the work of the ministry because every Christian is gifted to do the work of the ministry. And the purpose, if you, if you believe in the fivefold ministry, is to teach the saints to do the ministry. And uh, like I, uh, like I teach all over the world, pastors don't grow congregations; congregations grow congregations by bringing people to hear their pastor preach and say, "Come see what's going on at my church. Come see." But uh, he mentions apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And the, for a long time, this has been designated as the five gifts, the fivefold ministry. Well, I disagree with that connotation. A number of years ago, I had the privilege of teaching him uh, for a whole semester up at North Central University in Minneapolis. Uh, they, uh, uh, someone had endowed the college with a prayer of uh, 
someone had endowed the college with a chair of preaching, and they asked me to do the first one. So I had to fly to Minneapolis every week and preach in chapel and teach homiletics, how to prepare sermons and things like that. And, and the professor up there, I don't remember the lady professor's name, but she was professor of Greek. And she wrote an article, not fivefold, not fourfold, not threefold, not twofold, not onefold, not even onefold. And she had a very strong argument, and I, I agree with her totally, that all of Paul's lists are ad hoc. What does that mean? They are not exhaustive. There are many more ministries than five in the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, it's like the gifts of the Spirit. There are many more. There are uh, there's a whole lot more than just five apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. We read in First Corinthians 14 about governments. Uh, we read about helps. Uh, we read about all kinds of other ministries. And like when Paul talks about the works of the flesh in the book of Galatians, adultery, fornication, nacleolus, lasciviousness, idolatry, drugging, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murder, drunkenness, and partying, there are other gifts of the uh, there are other ministries of the flesh, other fruits of the flesh that Paul does not mention there. He mentions in other parts of the Bible. And so I don't believe in the fivefold ministry. There are many, many, many more ministries in the church than the five. And I think we have harped on this, the fivefold ministry. And uh, there should be all kinds of gifts taking place in the ministry. Now, there are five mentioned here, apostles. And they were the originators, and then prophets came along this, and then evangelists, and pastors, and teachers. But there are helps, and governments, and various other things mentioned. There are manifestations of the Spirit. There are, and uh, it's the same way with the fruit of the Spirit love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self control. Okay, what about the gift of, of giving? Okay, that's not mentioned there in Galatians 5, but it's also mentioned as a grace in other parts as a result of the Holy Spirit moving in your life. Love uh, is the primary one, and a lot comes from that. So, so we want to be totally gifted, but we have to understand that God has all, he put everything in the church that he needs. And it's a matter of each person finding out what their gift is. Now, I'm not a big fan of these gift surveys. And I was given one at different points in my ministry. And every time I made one out, it happened to be whatever I happened to be doing at the time was what I was strong in. When I was an evangelist, that, that came out as my strongest gift. When I was a pastor, it came out as my strongest of gifts. Uh, and I've always been a teacher. That comes out of one of my strong gifts. But there are other things that come out depending on what you're doing. But the Holy Spirit can show you wh where your ministry of gift is. You know, the Bible says God works in us to want to and do of his good pleasure. And maybe if God wants you to work with youth, you'll get that strong desire to work with youth. And then God will lead you into developing that gift and using that gift that he wants to give you and where he wants to use you in the church. So I agree with her, not fivefold, not fourfold, not threefold, not twofold, not anyfold, but a multitude of various gifts that God can use. And they're all needed in the church. If every Christian would find out where they are gifted and what God wants them to do, I don't think our churches would hold the people that would come in. And so we have to find out. But uh uh, you should have the prophetical taking place. There should be healing taking place. And healing is a manifestation of the spirit. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. It's not the gift of discernment, by the way. It's discerning of spirits. I've, I've met people down through the years that would grab your hand and try to examine you like that. They would say they had the gift of discernment as if they were trying to figure it out. The Bible does not talk about the gift of discernment. It talks about discerning of spirits. What spirit is motivating somebody to act like they do? Is it the human spirit, the Holy Spirit, or is it the enemy? And so he, he will give you discerning of spirits, but it takes the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you. It, it, it's an activity of the Holy Spirit, one of the manifestations of the Spirit. So, but but there should be absolutely pastors. A pastor is a shepherd. Also, the overseer of the church is the pastor. The you know the bishop. It also mentions deacons in the New Testament, and Phoebe is called a deacon, by the way, in Ephesians chapter 
uh, in Romans chapter 16, and Junia, a woman, is called an apostle in Romans chapter 16. And so God has all these various ministries in the church, and we need to find out what our ministry is. Can someone have the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit without being baptized into the Holy Spirit? All I can go is by the scriptural evidence. that It doesn't seem that they can have a, a one of the manifestation gifts that are mentioned in uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 without being baptized into the Holy Spirit. Uh, it... Uh, uh, when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, they're all manifestation from the Spirit. But now God can do anything he wants, but you don't read of it happening to people in the New Testament until after they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then these gifts seem to take place. You're obviously not going to speak in tongues unless you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it, they seem... It seems that churches that believe in people being baptized in the Holy Spirit, these gifts are manifest. I've never said, I'm not saying God couldn't do it in another church. I, I don't like to put God in a box. About trying time you try to put God in a box, he shows you he doesn't fit. And so God can do all kinds of things, but it's rare. Uh, it's rare. Can someone have manifestation gifts of the Spirit without being baptized in the Spirit? And again, the manifestation gift, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits, faith, miracles, healing, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. And the, it indicates in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, these should be taking place during the church service. Now, I know pastors to preach, and in the middle of the preaching, God gives them a prophecy. And he gives them something to say. I mentioned this last week that they had not planned on saying that is a prophetical gift in operation. But that goes along with the responsibility of being a pastor or being an evangelist or being a teacher. God will give you certain things to say. So I don't think we can put God in a box, but it generally seems to work the other way. Generally seems to work the other way. How does Brexit fit into Bible prophecy or does it? If you're not aware of Brexit, it's it's the nation of England withdrawing from the 10 nation uh, from the European common market. A number of years ago, when the European common market came on the scene, people were getting on the prophecy bandwagon and trying to say this is the 10 kingdom confederacy of the books of Revelation and Daniel. And I told them to be very cautious of it because it is not. It is not the Ten Kingdom Confederacy. The Bible doesn't talk about the revived Roman Empire. Okay, it isn't going to happen. There are no ten modern nations that make up the old Roman Empire, but it will be ten nations. And I've said for years there's a strong possibility that the new world government will be based in the United States, Great Britain, and Russia. And I don't know if that's the way it's going to be or not. It may possibly be that way. That's one scenario. And if the three dominant nations happen to be the United States, Great Britain, and Russia, then it would be necessary for Britain to withdraw. In my book, The Most Often Asked Questions on Sunday Night Alive, I made a proposal that possibly, uh, the Bible indicates in the book of Daniel, there will be a 10-nation confederacy, but there will be one little uh, and it mentions the 10 horns or 10 kings uh, in Daniel chapter 7. And it mentions there came a little horn up that plucked up three horns by the roots. And through the three, he, he ruled the 10, and through the 10, he ruled the world. And, and I mentioned that Daniel 7 may possibly imply the United States, Great Britain, and Russia. And just suppose the United States, I'm not saying this is going to be this way. This is a possible scenario. Just, just suppose tomorrow the United States, Great Britain, and Russia would find one person and say we're putting all of our military power at this person's disposal. Now, when I say Great Britain, I include places like Canada, New Zealand, Australia that still have a connection with Great Britain. United States, Great Britain, and Russia, we put all of our military and economic power at this man's disposal. What could the rest of the world do? And the book of Daniel clearly, clearly indicates China doesn't get into it until much later. And, and actually moves, uh, the kings of the east actually move against this western civilization power and get defeated. And so we don't know. It may fit into it. It may not fit into it. But there is a strong possibility.
strong possibility. It may be, it may not be. Now don't go out here and say Dr. Westlake says it has to be the United States, Great Britain, and Russia. It doesn't. That is a possible scenario. Now, if the world continues for a whole lot more years, maybe there won't even be these three nations in, in, uh, in the future. So, but the rapture of the church may take place tonight. Was the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD described in Jesus' prophecies of Matthew 24? Or was he describing something else? And then we got a second question, almost the same. How does Luke 21 and Matthew 24 fit together? Now, Luke 21 actually talks about the destruction of Jerusalem and also talks about the second coming at the end of the age. Now, Matthew 24 moves strictly into the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation period. And, uh, but but uh, in Luke chapter 11, let me turn over here to Luke 11. They ask the same questions. Uh, Matthew 24 and Luke 11, Jesus told them the temple was going to be destroyed. And Matthew 24 says, when shall these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? Use the Greek word parousia that used, uh, how much used in certain passages, it refers to the event we call the rapture and the end of the age at the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19, when Jesus comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, Luke, it only mentions two of the questions, okay? It only mentions two of the questions. When will Jerusalem be destroyed? Uh, I don't mean Luke 11, I mean Luke 21. Let me. Turn back over here to Luke 21. I don't know why I said Luke 11. Luke 21. And they ask, there's only two questions mentioned here. But, but I, in, in Luke, he deals with the destruction of the temple. Matthew does not deal with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD in Matthew 24. He uses some of the same terminology that Jesus used to refer to that. But when you read Matthew 24, uh, Matthew is the gospel to the Jew, and as I mentioned previously, much of Matthew's gospel is arranged topically, having to do with Israel. Last half of the tribulation will be when Israel receives Jesus Christ as their Messiah, and the Antichrist tries to destroy them, and Michael and his angels come on the scene and fight for Israel, and you can read about that in, in Daniel chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 12, and also Matthew 24. And so, but... but, but uh, Luke does talk about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and he uses a lot of the same terminology. And then he says in verse 20, when you see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, know that the desolation thereof is near. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. Don't let them in the countrysides enter into it. For these be the days of vengeance, and all things which are written may be fulfilled. Woe unto them that with child, and them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. They shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive unto all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now you read in Revelation 11 that there are yet three and a half years at that point left when Jerusalem will be trodden down to the Gentiles, Okay. Now he begins to talk about the end of the age. And there, there should be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, upon the earth, the stress of nations, perplexity of the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart failing them for fear, looking for those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud of power and great glory. And all these things begin to come to pass and lift up your heads and look, for your redemption draws near. And he goes on to say, behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they send forth leaves, we know that the, the, our own selves, that summer is near. When you see all these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is at hand. Truly I say unto you, now the King James says this generation, and I pointed this out before, translators usually don't know much about prophecy. And, and this is the Greek word genos. The basic meaning of the word genos is descendants of a common ancestor. So it should be translated this race, referring to the Jewish race will not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. And then he goes on to say, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with, 
overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness. And surfeiting is the breath that comes from alcohol and drunkenness and the cares of this life so that day come on you unaware. For as a snare, it will come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray that you may be worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. So Luke talks both about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and then the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19. They're separated by over 2,000 years. Well, it's a, now Matthew only talks about the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation period. And then after that, he talked about the rapture of the church. Some that claim to be prophets like to speak things about people's lives when they are totally wrong and told so. <laughs> they point the finger and say we cannot question a prophet's gift, even if wrong. Uh, would this show the prophet is being proven as false? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are so many false prophets around today. And that's why 1 Corinthians 14 says to judge the prophets. Judge it. Is it accurate? Is it being said? And uh, people come along and say things. Uh, just to give you an illustration, there was a man many years ago. I won't mention his name. I won't even mention in what church. It was not in the church I currently pastor. And I've been here 47 years. Again, Pastor Emeritus, not senior pastor for the last, for the last 14 years. My son is now. But that there was a situation where I went to the hospital to pray for a man that was dying. And uh, he had terminal cancer of the throat. Every time his heart would beat, blood would run out of his mouth. And the doctors called me at the home and they said, he's only got about an hour to live. Can you get here? And I rushed through town, got to the hospital, and I told him, you're about to step into eternity. You need to get saved. He said, I'm fine. I said, no, in about 30 minutes, you're going to drop into hell and burn forever. So he prayed the sinner's prayer and God spoke to me and said, I'm going to give him six months. Okay, well, I laid hands on him. I said, in the name of Jesus, I command the bleeding to stop. It stopped. And God gave that man six months to the day. But there were people who would stand up and prophesy that he was going to live for many years. And those were false prophets. Okay, okay, those were false prophets. And so uh, there are always false prophets around. And by the way, he died six months later to the day. The only one I told six months was my wife. And I told her God's given him six months. Now, why did God give him six months? He came from being the nastiest man in town to so sweet, he almost sick his wheat. God changed his life. And people saw the change that had taken place in him. But, uh, you know, there's always false problems. Some people, because God has used them, they think every thought they get from God. And it's not. The Bible indicates clearly the battleground is the mind. The weapons of our... Uh, uh, Weapons of our warfare are not fleshy, might if they're made through God to the tearing down of strongholds. Uh, they, uh, uh, let me go back and quote it earlier. Though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not fleshy, but they're mighty through God to the tearing down of strongholds. They bring every thought into the captivity of Christ and cast down imagination. The enemy being a spirit can put thoughts into your mind. You can develop thoughts, human thoughts, your own thoughts of what you would like things to be. Or you, can, or you can hear the Holy Spirit. Some people have the idea they always only hear the Holy Spirit. Then why did Paul say we had to battle that kind of a thing? Okay, why did we have to fight it? And uh, why do we have to battle with it? Because the battleground is the mind. And the enemy can put thoughts into your mind, thoughts of worry, thoughts of fear, temptation to sin. How does he tempt you to sin? Thought life. Thought life. And so it's, uh, it's learning to control the thought life. So we have to learn to do that. We have to learn to do that. It's a constant battle. It's a constant battle. And, the, uh, and a person can get human thoughts. And again, I've had people give me prophecies down through the years that I knew weren't for me. I had others give me ones that I were. God will use them to confirm, not to run your life. And some people say, People get so carried away with the, with the fact that God used them, they think they're infallible. That's why the Bible says to judge the prophecies. Judge them. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Like, uh, you know, when Paul, uh, when Agabus 
uh, he indicated that Paul was going to be bound when he went to Jerusalem. Uh, they all encouraged him not to go, but he knew he was supposed to go. And he did get bound, but he knew he was supposed to go. Okay, he didn't let them talk him out, talk him out of going, and going as you read the book of Acts. And some well-meaning people, you know, God does give people word, but some people get carried away with themselves. And because God uses you, don't forget, it's God's grace. Doesn't mean you're Mr. and Mrs. Super Spiritual. God uses us by his amazing grace. Anyone that God uses is by his grace. None of us deserve to be used of God in any sense, but he chooses to use us by his amazing grace. Can someone be baptized into the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues? The only evidence we have in the Bible when this happens is that they spoke in other tongues. Acts chapter 2, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. The Greek phrase is heteros glossolalia, meaning tongues, languages other than what they knew. In Acts chapter 10, while Peter was yet preaching, the Holy Spirit fell, and all them that heard the word, and they as a circumcision were amazed, as many as came with Peter, was on the gift of the poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak in other tongues and glorify God. Acts chapter 19. When Paul laid hands on them, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, and spoke in other tongues and prophesied. Acts chapter 19. And Acts, now we read about Paul being filled with the Holy Spirit, but we're not giving any details. But later as the Apostle Paul, he says, I thank God I speak with tongues more than ye all. So I go along with those that believe that speaking in other tongues is the initial outward evidence. The inward evidence is so much more. Yeah, you receive the Holy Spirit at salvation. Jesus breathed on the apostles and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit in John 20, and they did. But he told them, now you need to be tarried till you're endued with power from on high. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is power for ministry. You receive the Holy Spirit at salvation. That's like taking a cup and pouring water into it. When you're baptized in the Spirit, the, you, uh, that's like taking the cup and immersing it into the water and bringing it up full and running over. So the synonyms for that is the, the Holy Spirit fell on them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, but Jesus called it being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And after, uh, in Acts chapter 10, when it says, well, Peter was yet preaching, the Holy Spirit fell on all them that heard the word. And they are the Jews that came with Peter were amazed because on the Gentiles poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you uh, when you, when you read Acts chapter 11, when Peter got back to Jerusalem, was called on the carpet for preaching to the Gentiles. Why? They didn't believe the gospel was for the Gentiles. And Peter goes through the whole story and says, while I was preaching, the Holy Spirit fell on them as he did on us at the beginning. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John truly baptized into water, but you shall be baptized into the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And inasmuch as God gave them like gift as he did unto us, who was it I that I could withstand? God. So we believe the outward evidence is speaking a language that you don't know. And uh, because God can do that with every human being. Now, uh, Jack Hayford used to say he thought people could be filled and if they would, if they would yield, they would, uh, they would pray in the Holy Spirit. Or if they would yield and if they don't, it's lack of yieldness. But I'm not Jack Hayford, okay? I, I look at the initial outward sign. Was the thorn in Paul's flesh a demon because it says the messenger of Satan to buffet me? No, it was not a demon. Paul uses the word asthenia. The word asthenia is translated sick all the way through your New Testament. Does any among you have an asthenia? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them anoint with oil and the spirit of God. Oh, 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 okay. Let them anoint with the oil and the prayer of faith will save the sick. And an asthenia is a sickness. And if you read the book of Galatians, Paul indicated the reason he stayed so long in the Galatian region was his asthenia in the flesh. And he says, you didn't despise me. What would happen if someone was visibly sick? They'd withdraw themselves from that. But he says, you didn't despise me, but treated me as the messenger of God. That's in Galatians. Now, uh, he actually calls it a stake in the flesh, not a... You know, we get the idea a rose thorn. That's not what he's talking about. It's a stake. It was actually a long military weapon with a sharp point on it, like a spear, except we used as a stake. And they would put them around the bottom of their walls, too, for the enemy to be impaled upon. 
So Paul says, it was given this stake in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. And he besought the Lord three times that, the, that it might depart from him. And God said, no, my strength is made complete in your weakness. So whatever it is that made Paul weak may have been his speech, may have been something else. But it was something that bothered him. And if he saw the Lord three times, it might depart. First John says, he that is born of God does not practice sin, and the wicked one cannot lay hold of him. So Paul's thorn in the flesh was not a demon, but it was a messenger. It was a sickness. And, and uh, uh, he indicated it was from Satan, but the Lord said, I'm not going to heal you. I'm not going to do it. My strength is made complete in your weakness. Okay. Now, was the resurrection of Matthew 27, 51 to 53, the first resurrection? Are there not two resurrections indicated in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and John 5, 28 and 29? Well, actually, the, the, uh, the Bible uses the phrase the first resurrection uh, in the book of Revelation after the battle of Armageddon that says this is the first resurrection. But he means first as opposed to last, not first according to second, third, fourth, or fifth. First Corinthians 15 talks about the resurrection, says those Christ the first fruits, those that are Christ at his parousia, at his coming. And so you read in Matthew 24 that after the resurrection of Jesus, there were certain disciples, people that had died that were seen walking in the streets of Jerusalem. So when Jesus resurrected, other people were resurrected too. But he was the first fruits. And then uh, you read about the, the resurrections of people in the book of Acts. You read about the two witnesses in Revelation 11. You read about the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians 4 that takes place in connection with Revelation 4. The saints are in heaven in chapter 4 and 5. And, the, and then in Revelation 20, when those that are saved during the great tribulation period are resurrected, it says this is the first resurrection. The first as opposed to the last. Started with Christ the first fruits, it includes all those that were resurrected, all, all, all up until that time, all those that were resurrected. And the last resurrection will not be left of a thousand year reign of peace. Read the book of Revelation, chapter 20. And he makes it very clear. The first resurrection started with Christ, Christ the first fruits, those that are Christ at his parousia. Okay, the parousia includes everything that happens in the day of the Lord, the great tribulation period. But it was with Matthew 24 and uh, and again, Paul and Thessalonians. Matter of fact, the question said are not two resurrections mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. And it says the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But the times and, the times and seasons, the chronos and the kairos, the passage of time and the appointed time. I'm not going to write and I'm not going to talk about when the Lord is coming. It will happen as a thief in the night. Or Paul says, I'm not going to deal with that issue. But he makes it clear there will be resurrection of the of those that have died, there will be, uh, of those of us that are alive, will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But all that's included in the first resurrection. Again, it's first resurrection as opposed to last resurrection, not first, second, third, fourth, or fifth. Christ the first fruits, those that are Christ at his parousia, that would include those resurrected in Matthew 24, those that, that, that Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians. It would indicate those in heaven, Revelation 4 and 5. It includes the two witnesses in Revelation 13. It includes those that are resurrected following the great tribulation period. That is the first resurrection. Okay. Do we have the Jezebel spirit in the church today? I have trouble with the definition, the Jezebel spirit. When you read about Jezebel in the Bible, she was a fierce teacher of Baalism, teaching people to work, worship false gods. Okay. Uh, Paul already says in the book of Revelation, you, you suffer that Jezebel of a woman to teach my people to eat things sacrificed to idols. In other words, leading people into idolatry. And I've seen people use the phrase the Jezebel spirit in so many different ways, so many different ways. 
anything that we put ahead of God, you could call a Jezebel spirit. And I'm not really sure how the person that sent the question in is using it since I've heard it used so many different ways. How do you know if God is speaking to you? That is the most difficult thing in the world to know. It's the most difficult thing because we like to believe God says certain things to us that we want to hear. And this is where people that think every thought that comes into their mind is a prophetic gift from God, why they, why they get astray, why they give people false prophecies. They get something that comes from the not from God. I know a number of years ago, there was a lady that came to me and said, I have, she, she thought she was a prophet. And she pointed to a certain brother and said, I, uh, I have the gift of prophecy and I, I have the gift of discernment and I see a black cloud over that brother. And I said, sister, what you've got is the gift of suspicions and you need to put it aside because it's not from the enemy. And some people have that kind of a quote gift. Now, now there is a legitimate gift, but it will get, encourage, edify, strengthen, teach, encourage, edify. Now, that's what first Corinthians says. Okay, and will exalt Jesus Christ, and it will edify the person. And so to know, learn to recognize the voice of God, you can recognize it. You hear something from God, you put it into practice. You say, oh, that's it. Now, it's hard to recognize, so you have to be still and know that I'm God. You have to be in a place to listen and to spend time hearing what God has to say. And sometimes it's, you have to have that time just to get alone and sit quietly and hear what God has to say, get, get away from the noise of the world, and to be still and know that he's God. And uh, you can't let your mind's a total blank. You can focus your mind on God, and he will speak to you. The way he speaks with me is like a thought engulfs me, but different people he use, uh, 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 he speaks different ways, and they know it's the voice of God. Number one, it will not contradict the word of God. <coughs> It will not contradict the word of God, the principles of the word of God. You know, some people teach God will only do exactly what he did in the Bible. No, that's making the Bible equal to God. The Bible is only a small revelation of who God is. It's not a total revelation. Like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, now we see through a glass darkly, then face to face. Now we have knowledge and we will have full knowledge. And we have gnosis, we will have epinosis. And so uh, we don't see face to face yet, but, but the Bible, uh, he will not disagree with the principles of the Bible. And, but God does a lot of things that didn't happen in the Bible. Uh, I've mentioned an occasion here on the air that I was in an airplane that ran out of gas over Guyana, South America. The gas gauges were empty. The one engine quit. The other engine kept running for two hours on an empty gas tank. God didn't do that in the Bible. There weren't airplanes in the Bible, but it's a principle. He is a miracle working God, and he will not violate those principles. So uh, that's the first question. Like I heard a man years ago, he, uh, he told a, uh, uh, it was actually a man, a man, he was a song leader at a church. He said, God told him to divorce his wife and marry this marry the pianist and go start a church somewhere. No, God didn't tell him that. God didn't tell him that. He's not going to tell you things contrary to the Bible. So how do you know? It's, uh, you just learn. You learn to recognize the voice of God. And uh, you can learn to recognize it in spite of noise, but you have to be still. Sometimes you have to get quiet to hear the voice of God and know what he's saying. You know, we get in our prayer life and we... I would say our blesses and our gimmies, bless mom, bless dad, bless the kids, bless the church, bless this, give me this, give me that, give me something else, going to bed, good night, Lord, I prayed. Instead of taking time to thank God, to hear God, to be still and know that he's God. I had an interview many years ago. I had the privilege of preaching uh, at the Yoida Pentecostal Church in Seoul, Korea, biggest church in the history of Christianity. And the next day I got to spend about three hours with Dr. Cho Young E. And, uh, uh, he told me that he speaks, uh, he prays about six hours a day, and he said 90% of us listening. And that, that encouraged me because I was using a big part of my prayer life to listen to God, but not enough. And this was many, many years ago. And 
And that's mostly what my prayer life is, is listening, trying to hear what God has to say. What do you want me to do? How can I accomplish what you want for me? Uh, well, uh, how can I give you my day? How can I give you my time? What do you want from me, God? What do you want me to do? What do you have to tell me? And be still long enough to hear what he has to say. And then you can know. But again, the primary test, it will not agree with the principles of the word of God. It will not disagree with the principles of the word of God. Jesus made the statement that we must observe the law of Moses, Matthew 5.19, Seems to Paul, it seems Paul disagrees. Is this a contradiction? No. The law was valid until Jesus nailed it to the cross. Jesus nailed it to the cross. He said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill. When something is fulfilled, it is done. It is finished. It is over. It is through. And that's what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. Uh, if you read Romans 6, we are not under the law, but under grace. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3. Talks about as in the same way that Moses put the veil over his face so they couldn't see the glow disappear. The veil is over people's eyes until they turn to Jesus. And he mentions them that which is abolished. Uh, the book of Hebrews indicates to the Jews that God took away the first covenant, the Sinai covenant, that he might establish the second covenant, the new covenant. And the new covenant, you see, the old covenant was made between God and the people of Israel on Mount Sinai. The people of Israel didn't keep their part. It lay in shambles. It was a broken covenant. The new covenant is not made between us and God. The new covenant was made between God the Father and God the Son on the cross of Calvary. That's according to the book of Hebrews. The new covenant was between God and God. God the Son on man's side. God the Father on God's side. Neither party can fail in that covenant. So as long as we're abiding in Christ, we are part of an internal covenant. That's why Jesus said in John 15, keep remaining in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it keep remaining in the vine, no more can you unless you keep remaining in me. If a man does not keep remaining in me, he is cast forth the branch and is withered. And men gather them, cast them into the fire, they're burned, remain in me. And so we remain in him. We're part of that everlasting covenant between God the Father and God the Son. If he made the covenant with us, we'd, we'd have ruined it many, many times, all of us. But it's between us and him. But uh, I also mentioned the book of Colossians. And let me read that. Uh, let me turn over to Colossians here. He says in chapter 2, verse 13, You being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made you alive together in Christ, having forgiven you all trespasses. So what did he do? He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. It was contrary to us and took it out of the way and nailed it to his cross. Nailed it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he put them on display as put them on display as conquered foes. Let no man judge you and meet or drink in respect of a holy day of the new moon or the Sabbath, which are only a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. In other words, the law was removed. The law was removed. And you read the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. There were those trying to put the Jewish law on the Gentile Christians. And Peter and James and all the apostles said, no, only abstain from blood, from immorality, and from things sacrificed, okay? I'm sorry, from idolatry, from the blood, and from things strangled, and immorality. Those four things. <laughs> and Peter makes a statement, our fathers couldn't keep this law, nor us. In order to be saved by law. You have to keep it 100%. If you ever told a little itsy-bitsy lie, you're a lawbreaker, and you can't be saved by keeping law. Paul gives seven distinct arguments in the book of Galatians. When Jesus said it was finished, and God ripped the veil of the temple in two, don't forget that veil kept the people out of the presence of God. 
Only the high priest could go in once a year, and he had to sprinkle a bloody pathway to walk into the presence of God. He had to sprinkle a standing place before the Ark of the Covenant, for he could offer the sacrifices and do those kind of things in the presence of God. And the book of Hebrews says, we have a newly slain pathway. We can walk straight into the Holy of Holies, straight into the presence of God. So when Jesus said it was finished, that's when he fulfilled the law and the veil of the temple was written in two. The law was a 1,400-year-long finger pointing to Jesus. And when he fulfilled it, it was done, finished, over and through. Every principle of the law is repeated in the New Testament for Christians. Basically, the Ten Commandments are repeated for the New Test uh, in the New Testament for the Christian, except keeping the Sabbath day. That's not repeated for the Christian in the New Testament. Okay, that was that was for Israel. The Lord's Prayer made me think that God's will is not always done, but in James four fifteen, it seems to say that His will is always done. And that's when James says, you shouldn't say, I'm going to go here and I'm going to do this. You should say, if the Lord wills, we should do this or that. And however, the Bible makes it clear that God's will doesn't always happen. The Bible says twice in the New Testament, God is not willing that one soul should perish. It is not his will that one soul should perish. And uh, so... Uh, we know that people are going to be perish. God wants everybody saved. The Bible makes that clear. Two statements in the New Testament. The last message of the Bible in the book of Revelation, the spirit and the bride say, come, let him that's here say, come, let him that's thirsty come. And whosoever will, will, whosoever will exercise his or her will, come and drink of the water of life freely. But both Timothy and Peter indicate God is not willing that one soul should perish. So God wants everyone saved. And uh, he wants you saved if you don't know Jesus Christ. He paid the bill. God does not predestine anyone to heaven or hell. We have the choice. Again, the last message of the Bible is choose you this day who you will serve. Make up your mind. You, you can make up your mind to serve God by receiving Jesus Christ. So a lot of things happen that is not God's perfect will. And a lot of things happen outside the will of God. So God, again, God wants everyone saved. Okay, this already answered that question. Did the believers receive the Holy Spirit and they were baptized in Samaria in Acts chapter 2? Uh, in Acts chapter 8, excuse me. Yeah, this is an interesting passage in Acts chapter 8. Now, the Bible says that many as receive him, he gives power to become the children of God. But in Acts chapter 8, when Philip went to Samaria to preach, in Acts chapter 8, it says this. Uh, oops, had, had, had chapter 5. That's why it didn't make sense. Now, when Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them, and the people with one accord paid heed to those things which Philip spoke, hearing and seeing the miracles which he was doing, for unclean spirits cried with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies that were lame were healed. There was great joy in the city. There was a certain man named Simeon. You know, how many of you, Simon, which... Uh, before times in the same city used sorcery, he bewitched the people of Samaria, giving himself out that he was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is a great power of God. To him they had regard, because of a long time he had bewitched them with his sorceries. But when they believed Philip's preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. Now, again, no one was baptized until they received Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So, therefore, they did receive the Spirit, but it wasn't obvious. It wasn't evident, okay? It wasn't outwardly evident. Simon himself believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and one beholding the miracles and the signs which they were doing. With when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John, when they were come, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And, we, for, and yet he was fallen upon none of them. In other words, he certainly came in. They were born again. 
but the word fallen goes along with what we call being baptized in the spirit. They were baptized only in the name of Jesus. They, they, their hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Now, what did Simon see? What could he have seen that let him know? A.T. Robertson, the great Baptist scholar, uh, uh, he was the premier Greek scholar of a previous generation. Uh, his grammar of the Greek New Testament in the light of historical research is an eight and a half by 11 book this thick. And one of the premier scholars in the history of Christianity taught at Baptist seminary. He makes a statement in word pictures in the New Testament. The only thing Simon could have seen was speaking in other tongues. Why? Because that was the distinctive New Testament gift. And uh, now A.T. Robertson didn't believe it was for today. Now, I, I don't see anywhere in the Bible that says it ceased, okay? But he didn't believe it was for today, but he believed that that was the only thing Simon could have seen because that's what was prevalent in the book of Acts. So, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to see. We have a lot of good questions here. Here's one, Here's one just came in. We know that in the end time, the hearts of men wax over to accept what is wrong as though it were right. Homosexuality appears to be one of these uh, very positive lifestyles. Do you agree? Yes. Yes. I, I agree with you. The Bible very plainly calls homosexuality a sin. It does it several times in the New Testament. And, and one statement made in connection in Romans chapter 1 uh, is the fact that they could have had a I was actually talking about the heathen. They could have had a revelation of God in creation and known there's a God. Instead, they turned to idolatry and immorality. Idolatry and immorality. And the immorality mentioned is men with men working that that's contrary, and even likewise the women changing the natural use in their men to that which is contrary to his nature. So it talks about homosexuality and lesbianism, among with other things. Now, let me say one sin isn't worse than any other sin, but it says God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now, a reprobate mind means you're no longer able to distinguish right from wrong. It's the Greek word adakimos, a disapproved mind, no longer able to distinguish what is right and what is wrong. And contrary to the word of God. And the Bible is very, very strong. The Bible is very, very strong in that area throughout the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 6, where Paul lists a list of the sins, he includes homosexuality, along with all other sins. But again, any sin is not worse than any other sin. The problem is convincing yourself that it's okay to do this. And so before we can really be saved, we have to admit that the things that we're doing are contrary to God's word. Again, we all have to repent of something. I know the night when I went down, I heard the gospel for the first time uh, in Little Assembly of God Church in Detroit where my mother was attending. And the, the, uh, I can't tell you what the pastor preached. Uh, some of you heard the story before. I get home from church. I was going to a church that didn't. And never let me know I could have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Recited the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer and sang the doxology, but didn't know Jesus. And the only thing I heard about the Word of God was one verse read or two or three, and statement made God had his blessing in the reading of his word, but I never was taught it. And my mother, I get home from church one Sunday, and my son on the phone with her friends. She said, you're going to church with me tonight. I said, I'm not going to your church. I've got my own church. I got a date. I'm, I'm not going to your church. I, had a, I was 19 years old, and, and I had a little dancer I was dating that was 18, gorgeous lady. I said, I got a date with her. I'm not going to your church. Well, an hour later, the girl called and broke the date. I got so mad, I told my mother, I'll go to your crummy church if you shut your big mouth and never ask me again. So I went to church with her. And when the pastor gave the altar call, who wants to know Jesus Christ? I can't tell you what he preached. My hands started tingling. Pulled them apart. They quit. Put them back together, started tingling. If you, if you need to know Jesus, raise your hands. So I put my hand up. The man next to me said, if you want to go down and pray, I'll go with you. So we went down and prayed. And, and the first thing they said was, son, ask God to forgive you for your sin. Well, if I hadn't been in church, I'd have hit him. I thought, what do you mean? I haven't stolen any more than the rest of the guys. Why should I ask God to forgive me for my sin? But I had to do that. 
because I had to admit that it was wrong. The second time, I know it was the Holy Spirit. He was showing me that my lifestyle was wrong. And I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart, prayed the sinner's prayer, made a commitment in my life to him. And the pastor said, we well, want the young man to give a testimony. I said, what's that? He said, what's God done for you? I said, I don't know, but something happened. Well, it did. I'm 88 now, and it gets better every day. It's happened my whole life. Got to preach this gospel all over the world. And it's exciting what God does when he changes you. And he transforms you and makes you a brand new person. So but as long as I think my lifestyle is okay, how can God deal with me? And again, one sin isn't any worse than any other. We need to treat people properly. Just because you disagree with someone doesn't mean you mistreat them. And that's a tragedy when anyone that has, has a disagreement with us is mistreated, okay? Or anyone felt they're not welcome. And everyone ought to be welcome everywhere the gospel is preached and by Christians. And so let me encourage you to be people of love and people of compassion and people that care, okay? Now, I was told no one ever heard of a rapture of the church until 1830, and then it was a young lady that taught it. Well, that is not true. I know there's a book that came out, The Incredible Pre-Trib Rapture Theory, that made that statement, and I keep this, this handy. I'm bad at remembering dates. I'm bad at names and dates. I really am bad at names and dates. So I keep this handy. This is in my book on Revelation. Okay, in my book on Revelation. And I mentioned, first of all, that pseudo Ephraim, somewhere between the fourth and seventh century, talked about the rapture of the church, about Jesus coming for his church and taking them to heaven and then coming back with him after the great tribulation. And then there's others. Peter Giro, 1687, taught that there would be a secret rapture of the church. He wrote a book called The Approaching Deliverance of the Church that Jesus was coming for his church and then coming back, church would be coming back with him following the great tribulation period. I disagree. Uh, the only thing I disagree with him, I don't believe it's going to be secret. I think it'll be one of the noisiest, best known events in the history of the world. And some others that taught it way before them, Philip Dondry, 1738, John Gill, 1748 used the term rapture and talked about it would be at a time prior to the tribulation and to separate Christians from the tribulation and prior to the time when Jesus comes back. James McKnight, 1763. Uh, Thomas Scott, 1792. You see, during the Middle Ages and even the Protestant Reformation, they didn't discuss prophecy. Uh, the Protestant Reformation in 1517, when people begin studying the Bible again, their theme was sola scriptura. Okay, everything has to be based on the scripture. But they weren't interested in prophecy. Augustine had taught in the 4th century AD that the book of Revelation was nothing but a spiritual allegory, and we're going to convert the world. When we get it converted, Jesus will come back. Well, the Reformers weren't, weren't interested in changing that. But when people began to seriously study the Bible, then they saw these prophecies in the book of Revelation were absolutely going to happen. Absolutely going to happen, okay? And uh, they were absolutely going to take place. And that, that prophecy was a legitimate Bible study. And there was going to be a rapture of the church. And there was going to be a great tribulation period. And, and the church is not going to convert the world. The Battle of Armageddon doesn't show the world welcoming Jesus back as King of kings and Lord of lords. It says, I saw the armies of this world gathered together to make war against him. And you can read about it in Revelation chapter 19. I saw heaven open and a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and righteousness he does judge him make war. His eyes are as a flame of fire, and out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He has on his vesture and his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw the arm of the beast and the false prophet, and the armies of this world gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse. And the beast and the false prophet were taken and cast into the lake of fire, and the rest were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. Yeah, the only weapon mentioned on our side at the Battle of Armageddon is the two-edged sword of Jesus' mouth. In other words, he's going to speak the word, and it'll be all over. And so it is going to happen. And uh, these things are absolutely going to happen. So we need to reread what the Bible says. Uh, 
what what is wrong with being a Catholic or even an Orthodox Christian? There's nothing wrong with it if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But so often, like the church I was raised in, I didn't know I could have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And some of the things, uh, I know a lot of good, uh, some of the greatest saints in history have been in the Catholic and Orthodox churches. Some of the people that I quote in my college teaching have been in these churches down over the years. That doesn't mean the teaching of all these churches is right. For instance, in the New Testament, there's no such thing as a separate office of a priest. Every believer has access straight into the presence of God. The only priest mentioned is our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, says you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him that have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So you are the priesthood, every believer. The adoration of the Virgin Mary is contrary to scripture. She was a godly woman, but she had other children beside Jesus. Read your Bible. Jesus had brothers and sisters. Okay, we're told that. James that wrote the book of James, Jude that wrote the book of James, were brothers of Jesus. And it mentions that he had sisters. She was a godly woman, but she had other children. The Bible says Joseph did not have sex with her until after she brought forth her firstborn son. And uh, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The saints can intercede for you. Mary can intercede for you. Jesus is the one intercessor. We all have access to the throne of grace. But again, there's good born-again Christians in, everyone, in every one of these areas that have had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and know him. That's what it comes down to. It's not the name over the door. It's not what you call yourself. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Again, the Bible says, he that has the son has life, and he that doesn't have the son does not have life. As many as receive him, he gives power to become the children of God. Relation with Jesus Christ, knowing him. And the issue is, do you know him? Do you just know about him, or do you know him? Do you have that relationship with him? And many great Orthodox Christians, many great Catholic Christians have had that relationship with Jesus Christ. I know I was asked many years ago during the days of the charismatic Catholic Church when there was a great charismatic outpouring among the Catholics, I was asked to go to a Catholic high school and teach on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And of course, to me, before I teach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you need to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. And, and what, I, what I basically believed before I met Jesus Christ was long as I believe he's the son of God, that makes me a believer in Jesus. Well, the Bible says the demons believe that and tremble. The word belief in the New Testament, the Greek purpose duo, is also translated commit. Paul says the gospel was committed to me. That's the word translated believe all the way through the Bible. So it's a commitment of your life to Jesus Christ, to receiving him as Savior. A commitment of your life makes you a believer. So I wrote on the board, and all the students were in there, and the priests and nuns, and, and uh, it was an area-wide Catholic school, not just a city one. And, and I wrote on the board, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? And I thought they, would, they, they were going to say, well, it means to believe he's the Son of God. And a little nun sitting in the front row, looked like she must have been in her 20s, raised her hand. It means to recognize you're a sinner, to ask God to forgive your sin, and ask Jesus to come into your heart and be born again by the Holy Spirit. Well, they want my battle plan, because that's exactly what it means. And there are many great uh, priests and nuns that I've met over the years that have a living relationship with Jesus Christ. I've had a friendship with many of them. I've had the privilege of speaking in Catholic churches. And uh, because the, the issue is when there's a priest and nun there believe a personal experience with Jesus Christ, they invite people to speak. And I've, I've had that privilege on a number of occasions. And it's uh, great Christians. And so there's nothing wrong with being that if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I was raised in a liberal Protestant church that didn't believe a whole lot of anything. And I didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So it's just as bad. 
got to have that relationship with him. Again, Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. I hate clocks. I'm about out of time. And we, we had a couple more questions called in. I'll, I'll have to get to those next week. I apologize. Now, if you have questions you want discussed next week, you can send them by email, dr. G-W-W-J-R stands for Dr. George W. Westlake Jr. D-R-G-W-W-J-R at gmail.com and we'll try to get to them next week. And uh, let me remind you about my book on Revelation. It is available on eBay. It's chapter 66. I've taught Revelation all over the world uh, in Bible colleges and seminaries. It's my most requested course. And I tried to keep it. God didn't give us a book saying, I don't want you to understand this book. He gave us a book to understand. And so I wrote this book, chapter 66. I wrote a textbook many years ago, many of you know, that's used in over 80 countries of the world. But in that one, I had to examine all the different ideas. This one, chapter 66, is the way I teach it and the way I see it after studying it for over 60 years and having read somewhere between 150 and 200 books on prophecy. So again, it's, it's available on eBay. And it's under George Westlake, chapter 66. And I wrote it simply so everybody could understand it. The book of Revelation is very, very understandable. And it tells us the things that are going to happen. It says it's the end of the end and conclusion of the story, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the name of the book, the revelation of Jesus Christ in your Bible. There's 26, uh, uh, there's 26 different pictures of Jesus just in the book of Revelation. It's an unveiling about him. Uh, but if you don't know Jesus Christ, just pray this simple prayer. Dear Father, I ask you to forgive my sins in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I give you my life. I give you everything I am and everything I hope to be. Save me right now. Make me a real Christian. Help me to live for you from now on. Help me to find a good Bible-believing church. Help me to understand your word. Help me to tell others about your love. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll look for you next week. Please send your questions, drgww at gmail.com. God bless you.